morning. Welcome to today's MPG Primer session. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. James Piricello. Uh, he is an instructor at Harvard Medical School and an assistant in medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital, where he practices cardiology. He's been a Brody since he jo joined Secretary's lab in 2009. He's now a postdoctoral scholar in Patrick Eleanor's lab, applying deep learning to learn about human genetics. And we're very much looking forward to his talk today. Um, and he is happy to take your questions during his talk. So please post in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and we look forward to it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and I'm excited to be here talking uh, to our colleagues at MPG. Uh, I've been a member of this community for like 10 years. So it's fun to, to talk to you about some of the work that we're doing. And I'm going to try to focus this talk um, in a way that's not just about my research, um, but really to try to walk you through one way to approach um, biomedical problems with deep learning as a tool in your toolkit um, for answering some questions. And, you know, in general, or I would say maybe always, these um, projects should start with something that motivates it. Like it's, I don't think it's a great idea to be like, I want to apply deep learning to a problem. I think you should have a problem and sort of come around to, um, you know, you may want to use deep learning for it. Maybe you don't need it. Um, in this case, I'm going to focus on ascending aortic aneurysm, which is a enlargement of the aorta, which is the largest blood vessel in the body. It brings blood from the heart to the rest of the body. And right now, you know, unlike the abdominal aorta where we have screening guidelines, we don't have any guidelines for who whose aortas we should image. So we don't pick this up until people develop symptoms. And the symptom of an enlarged aorta is typically aortic dissection, which is uh, a tear in the wall of aorta, uh, which is a highly painful, morbid, and mortal condition. It's the 15th leading cause of death in older adults. So the idea that we could identify these people and start thinking about treatments for them early um, would be very appealing. Um, so we want both to be able to think about the risk and also to try to find new therapeutic targets. And I'm showing these pictures. These are um, the supervisors of this work. This is Patrick Eleanor on the left and Mark Lindsay on the right. I'm sure you all know Patrick um, because he's an institute member. Um, and Mark Lindsay is uh, a Brody and also a member of the uh, Thoracic Aortic Center at MGH. So he's got particular insight into this disease process. Okay, so we've got a motivation. Like we have a thing we care about. What is our goal? Um, sometimes it depends on what data you have access to. And I'm just gonna orient you here to imaging and like how to see uh, cross-sectional human imaging. Um, so when you're looking at an image of someone's body, um, you have to imagine that they're laying on their back and you're looking from their feet to their head. And the views that I'm gonna be showing you today are views of the, uh, the thoracic ascending and descending aorta at the level of the right pulmonary artery. And so here I am highlighting the ascending aorta in red and the descending aorta in yellow. And I'm gonna talk about a property called strain. So I'm gonna to need to define that for you. I'm gonna do it visually. So if this big red circle is the area of the aorta when it's at its biggest during the cardiac cycle, like when the heart is pumping blood into it, and this brown circle is that same aorta, but it's at the end of the cardiac cycle when it's sort of draining the blood out into the end tissues, they're not quite like the, you know, the aorta is dynamic. It's fairly subtle, but it does change in size. And so we define a term called strain, which you get by subtracting the smaller area from the larger area and dividing in that by the smaller area. So we have a motivation, we have a goal, like we would like to measure aortic strain from cross-sectional imaging, in this case, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging. And like what I envision, is we'll have a population distribution of these measurements. So if strain is on the x-axis here, and it's 
probably somewhere between zero and 0.3. It's a dimensionless number. Um, most of the people will have very little strain, but some people will have like a lot of strain. Some people will have almost no strain at all. So there's gonna be some distribution. I would like to measure a strain value for every person whose imaging I have access to so I can learn what that distribution is and do downstream analyses. So we have a goal, but like, how do we get there? Like, what, what do we need to get ourselves there? So, you know, I'm showing you a video, but that's not really how the data comes to us. This is just one choice for representation of 100 images um, that were acquired over the course of about uh, a few seconds, one cardiac cycle. So if at a heart rate of 60, this would be 100 images over one second. So you could stack those images up in a variety of ways. And from the standpoint of like a deep learning model, I think the two most straightforward choices for how you represent these data are either just like pretend like there's no relationship between the data. I've just got a hundred different two-dimensional images um, or um, like actually formally encode the relationship across those data and say like, this is kind of a three-dimensional object. Time is my third dimension. So one person's input rep representation is a like a tensor. It's a 3D object that doesn't just have a width and a height, but also the time dimension. And we need to bring that whole block in together. And so like when you're making that choice, there are consequences for how you can process these data. So um, obviously like how you aggregate your data for input, that's not very hard. Um, that's not a big deal, but it does have a big impact on which model architecture is gonna be usable. Um, there are different architectures that are gonna be used for two-dimensional and three-dimensional data. And then also like, you know, what is the output gonna look like? Um, it's not fully baked based on your input, but it does certainly influence what type of output you can produce. And also like what that means for how much labeling you're gonna to have to do. And so sort of walking through that, if, our, if we're gonna use images as separate objects, um, then to me, the natural thing to do would be to use a pre-trained vision model because people have been working on this problem of like, processing two-dimensional images through deep learning models for a decade. So this is like really well-trodden ground. You're gonna find good architectures. You're gonna find pre-trained architectures where you can really just modify the last few layers of the model to learn your specific problem. So there's like a lot of upside to using this type of model. In contrast, you know, for the 3D, object representation, you're going to be using a three-dimensional model and there's just less available architectural design work that has been done for that. It's not zero. People are interested in it. People are developing models for like uh, processing movies, for example. So, you know, there's certainly interest. It's just not as mature uh, as the two-dimensional work. So for me, when I see this type of you know, these, these two options, I say, let's try just treating these as separate two-dimensional objects first. So sort of marching through, we have like, we wanna get these measurements of aortic strain and we would like to use just two-dimensional images um, as our input. So then when it comes to modeling, you know, like I would suggest really trying to find a pre-trained model, I realize that like, it's fun to make your own model. And like, I do it, I enjoy it. Uh, but if you're doing a task that has like a lot of research that's already been done on building an architecture, I would just strongly encourage you to try that at the very least as a baseline, pick up a, a pre-trained model and apply it to your problem. Um, so then, you know, like it's a deep learning talk. So I'll talk a little bit here about uh, different model types. And I see something's popped up in the chat. Maybe this is a good time to pause and answer that. Oh, I think it was a reminder asking people to put questions in. Um, 
but one of actually one question I brought up, or I, I was wondering when you were just saying that is, do you have a um, sense of how to how to choose a first pre-trained model? Because many times there's many available, right? Yeah. And so when yeah. you look at them, is there a particular metric that or quality to the pre-trained models that help you choose one to start with? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, that would actually be a good set of slides, um, which I don't have in this. So what one approach um, is to sort of think about, you know, your model needs to be able to memorize your training set or like a good base, like a bad outcome is your model learns nothing and it spits out the mean of your data set. Like you don't want that. Um, people worry about overfitting where like your model just memorizes your input but I'm not too worried about that. Um, you can always like choose a simpler model. So most of these models, um, so, and maybe, um, I'll skip forward just for a second, just so we have this on the screen. Most of these models that kind of come pre-trained, whether you're using TensorFlow or PyTorch, um, they have different depths that you can choose. So there's like a variety of, ResNets, there's like a ResNet 34, a ResNet 50, a ResNet 101. And what that just means is like, we've kind of repeated the same stuff more times. And so those bigger models have more representational capacity. And so one way to do it is to take one of the bigger models and just try to like overfit to your data, prove that you have everything working um, by memorizing your input. And once you've memorized your input, like that means you're going to win the game. It's just a question of can you now make that model generalized? So I, I prefer starting with bigger models and then cutting back to smaller ones after I've taught my model to memorize my data. So that way I, I find some balance of, you know, smaller models are easier to train or like they're faster to train um, and they're smaller, like they're like literally when you're uploading them to Google Drive or whatever, it's not as big. Um, so there are nice properties to them and they're they're going to be less likely to overfit but you want to prove to yourself that you're like capable of overfitting first so that's that would be my suggestion um part of it in terms of choosing which type of model comes down to uh, specifics of your problem so that that part can be a little bit harder um but i would say start big like the the, the advice that is maybe counterintuitive is like start big try to overfit and then worry about regularizing um so you can generalize outside of your training set. So just to step through, I mean, like in my mind, there are kind of like three main architectural types that are common, at least right now in deep learning. One is like a fully connected network. And I, I don't mean like putting a fully connected head at the end of a convolutional network. I mean, like you could build a network where your inputs, so like if this input layer each dot is like a pixel from your image. And you could pass that through to another layer where each dot receives input from every prior uh, uh, dot. And that is very effective in theory. And if computation were infinite and like unbounded, then this would be a great way to do it because this model can represent anything. Um, as long as you have enough capacity, as long as it's big enough, you could learn any type of function. So um, it's a very like generalizable fitting tool, but practically speaking, there is a lot of computation that is basically wasted if you know a little bit more about what type of problem you're trying to solve. Um, so if your data is an image, we know a lot about how images work. Um, and we, you know, humans have been designing like filters to do different processing on images for a long time. So I don't think that we have to pretend like, you know, the pixel in the top left corner of your screen and the pixel in the bottom right corner of your screen are equally likely to have some sort of interaction as two pixels right next to each other. And that's where convolutional networks come into play because instead of like passing the full amount of data from every pixel to every other pixel, convolutional networks um, learn a set of filters 
So one thing that I found tr to be tricky when I was like learning this for the first time is people will show you one convolutional kernel. And so like, what do I mean by that? I literally just mean you have a grid and usually it's literally a three by three grid. Uh, so you're, you're going to look at nine total pixels from your input and you're gonna weight them in a certain way. That way is actually gonna be learned by the network. And you're going to sum them up uh, into one pixel in the next layer. Um, so that is pretty straightforward. But the thing that I think is often like not conveyed is like, so that's one kernel in your like set of filters. And you're gonna learn many of them. You're gonna learn like usually tens to hundreds of them for every layer. And so I think that that's kind of like a useful thing to understand. So, so this, if this yellow thing is my image, uh, one kernel is gonna create this second layer. And then like, I'm gonna have like 64 copies of that second layer all produced by different kernels. And those kernels all started randomly. And so they're gonna learn different differently. And so you're gonna have this like batch of um, like 64 uh, slightly changed versions of your input thanks to the slightly different uh, learned weights in those kernels. And so then like, you might say, well, gosh, I'm not, like these kernels can't learn that much about the image because they're only looking at nine pixels. And that's true, but once you start to go deeper, then all of a sudden the receptive field of you know, the output of each kernel becomes bigger. So by the second layer, right, you're, you're able to see this entire five by five image, you know, it, that one pixel has access to information from all 25 pixels in the input. And so as you go deeper, your receptive field grows substantially. And so typically, you know, in these very deep convolutional neural networks, when you're talking like tens to hundreds of layers, you eventually get to the point where all of the input data could be perceived by one of these pixels in a deeper layer. So that's how you sort of sidestep this issue of at any given layer, you're not allowed to see that much. So, so typically we think of these early kernels as learning like edges and corners. And once you get deeper, you can find more complex representations um, that are activating those kernels. So there are like a few kind of like common architectures. These all at some point won like the best architecture award for a, an annual contest that kind of looks at who is the best at, um, sorry, uh, that, I guess that comes later. Um, who's the best at identifying which category an image comes from. Um, and so, they have different strengths, but these are all convolutional neural networks. I would say, it, to my mind, the ResNet family is the most commonly used default. Um, and like, if I'm just gonna do some sort of two-dimensional image analysis, I'm gonna start with a ResNet. And I, you'd have to give me a reason to, to use something else. And there are, there are often reasons to do it, but this would be my default for basically any task. Um, so then the third, so we talked about fully connected networks, um, residual, uh, uh, convolutional networks, and then something that is new in the past year is a vision transformer. So um, like in 2017, there was the attention is all you need paper um, that was important for like language modeling. Um, and people have been thinking about how to adapt that for image modeling. Um, and so I, I like this um, representation um, where people are developing um, a vision transformer for image recognition. And this, this is like a pre-training example. So we're gonna set up the problem as a sequential problem. So we take our image, we literally just chop it up into patches of 16 by 16 pixels. And then what they do here is they randomly choose which patches they're gonna feed into their model. They take those sequential patches, they put it 
they train their encoder with it. And then the, the problem that they're solving is how to reconstruct the entire image. So then they have these masked uh, patches, which is basically just to say, like, we know that for the first two uh, patches, we didn't include them. So we're going to ask the model to reconstruct them from scratch. And so we take this sort of masked version of our image, put it through a decoder, asking it to uh, inpaint the missing patches. And then, you know, we're trying to get it to reproduce um, the bird. I, I'm not spending much time on ambition transformers because I haven't personally used them um, aside from like doing some pre-training, uh, but they're like promising. And I think people are pretty excited about them. There appears to be like, uh, pretty good scaling if you have a ton of data, um, which in general we don't in biomedical imaging, like hundreds of millions of images. Okay, so like the point I'm trying to convey and pick your model, it's less about the architectures. You know, I wanted to like touch on them, um, but it's really like once we've chosen an input representation, that actually kind of bounds us or binds us a lot in terms of like what type of model we're going to be using. Um, so like I said, we chose a 2D image as our input representation in part because of my familiarity um, with like convolutional neural networks and ResNets. So these choices are like intertwined. But you know, it gets us to the point where we have our goal, which is we want to measure aortic strain. We have our input representation, which is like a series of two dimensional images, but just one at a time. And so now we've sort of decided we're gonna use a ResNet. This is just the first pass. Like you, if you think about this as an experimental type of science, you might find that the model that you develop in your first pass doesn't work well, but your goal should be like to understand the problem well enough and your input and your output well enough to make decisions like, okay, actually, I don't think that the model can learn the tasks I want it to learn unless I use a three-dimensional model. So I'm gonna to have to switch. So then for our output, so you know, as, as we're thinking about like our different inputs and our different outputs, um, we could ask the model to do a re regression. Um, we can't ask if, if we're gonna do two-dimensional images as our input for the purpose of aortic strain, which requires knowing aortic diameter at different times during the cardiac cycle, I don't think it's reasonable to ask the model to tell me what the strain is from one single image. But we could ask it to at least tell us what the aortic area is. And then you know you take that for all 100 images separately. And in post-processing, you could figure out the strain. Like That would be reasonable. And don't get me wrong, like you could probably ask it to tell you strain, and it'll learn strain within the, the bounds of like, you know, there's a correlation between diameter and strain. It's so like the bigger your diameter is in general, the lower your strain is. Higher strain is basically good. It just kind of means like how much like uh, energy is your aorta capable of like taking in and then like redistributing later. So this is like a number we'd like to be larger and lower is typically bad because it means it's kind of like hardened. So, um, so yeah, like a big aorta typically can't get much bigger during the cardiac cycle. Um, so you could like, I guess I'm just saying you could make the model learn strain directly from one image. It's just gonna be much worse than if you didn't make it do that. So like, don't, I would not recommend <laughs> handcuffing yourself in that way. Um, the other thing you can do with, with two dimensional images is called semantic segmentation, which is labeling all the pixels. And I'll get more into that in the next slide. If we had chosen a three-dimensional object, um, so like the full stack as our input, you could then actually do a regression where you're asking for that one value for like, just tell me aortic strain um, because it has access to all parts of the cardiac cycle. So it could in theory learn that. Um, you could also still ask it to do semantic segmentation. So, um, what semantic segmentation is, is just providing a label, a semantic label to all the pixels in an image. So in this case, on the left, we're just taking 
a raw cross section uh, through the thorax. Now on the right, we're applying a, a label that has meaning. So this red thing is in the aorta, it's enlarged. And the blue thing is, so that's red is ascending, blue is descending in this image here. That's all semantic segmentation is. Um, but, you know, I actually, I like se semantic segmentation a lot. One of the reasons is like, you know, people talk a lot about interpretability of models and this doesn't give you interpretability in like the formal way, but it does allow you to like judge the output of the model in a really intuitive way. Like if the model is just telling me that someone's aortic diameter is four centimeters, I can't really eyeball that. Like I have to measure it. Um, if the model is showing this red outline on top of the person's body, if it's not in the right spot, then I know that the model's not doing the right thing. So it's a really easy way to just sort of troubleshoot your models. Um, and you can look at the extremes and say like, is this big aorta actually, you know, marking the right territory, yes or no. Um, and there's also like, you know, from the standpoint of training, when you're doing a regression task, when you're asking the model, you're like feeding in an image, like let's say 250 by 250, like tens of thousands of data points. And you're gonna train this whole model based on one number for that person. You're like, ah, I want this to learn that this image is gonna give me a you know, four centimeter aorta. So you kind of have to like propagate this information from just one value. Whereas when you're doing semantic segmentation, you give the model a lot of opportunity to be penalized. So, you know, it can start to be penalized for like not putting the aorta in the right spot. And then as it learns more, you can really, um, you know, as it's doing a good job of generally putting the pixels over the aorta, what it's gonna be learning towards the end is like, how do I really get this fine grain boundary? Um, so I, I think it's very useful to have so much opportunity to penalize a model um, in a way that is aligned with your own visual cortex. So, you know, based on what I've been saying and the fact that we're using two dimensional images as our input, I'm going to propose a two stage approach. So, the first stage is we'll do semantic segmentation. So, we're going to manually label um, a bunch of images. It doesn't have to be all that many if you're using a pre-trained model. So like um, for this particular task, we used 116 images and you can imagine like drawing circles 116 times is like not very much work. It, you could do it in an afternoon. Um, so we'll train a model to do semantic segmentation. James, and then- Interrupt oh, yeah. if I may, with a question that just popped up. Um, and the question is, how does segmentation compare with penalized regression? Um, yeah, so like sort of like a lasso or something like that. Um, I, so it depends on your task. Like in my case, um, like you might say, um, I, I think it depends on how you think about formulating it. So I've never really thought about formulating this in that way. Um, you could, you could potentially on a pixel wise basis, formulate this as a penalized regression model. Um, I'm just thinking about um, what the difference would look like um, if you were trying to do a penalized regression model for just like the diameter. And that, that part, I'm not sure. Um, if they could, if there's like more that they could add in the question, like, like one approach you could take, and I'm not sure if this is what people are getting at, it, um, but you could take all these pixels, right? And you could have a, like a linear regression model, like just a plain old linear regression model in R where the value of each of those input pixels is provided and the output is the diameter and you penalize the number of like non-zero param. Like I would probably do a lasso um, or like at least an elastic net where you're penalizing um, like both the number of non-zero parameters and also kind of regularizing. So 
Um, I've never done that, but that is definitely something you could do. If you were trying to like prove that the deep learning model was superior, like if that were like, you know, as a geneticist, I don't really care if it's superior. I kind of care if it is good enough to do what I need it to do and if I can understand it. But if you were like coming to, you know, show that deep learning is superior to reg regression, then I actually think that that would probably be a good way to do it. Just like shove in the pixel values um, and learn a, a penalized regression model. The one part that I think would be hard is like, you know, so in my case, I'm able to use a model that was pre-trained for a different task. And I, I kind of get into that a little bit more later. So like I'm taking advantage of these weights that were learned on millions of images. Um, so like it, it, I don't have to teach the model like how to sort of do these early, like what's a filter, what's an edge? Like it, it already has learned those things for, from this other task. So I guess the thing that I would find hard is that your parameters are much greater than your number of labeled samples in that type of um, penalized regression model. Um, so that seems like you would have a hard time getting it to work well um, and to generalize, but I, I haven't done it, so I don't know. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so, so like the two, the two stage, this is just me decomposing the problem because I think it's much easier. So we have a two dimensional image, we're gonna do segmentation, and then you just count the pixels, right? So like each person has a hundred different images, I'm counting the number of pixels that belong to their aorta. Um, I know the size of each pixel because it's metadata provided about each picture. And then, so then I just have to like keep track of the biggest and the smallest out of their hundred images. And then I know their aortic strain. So I think this is a very simple way. Like, sure, it's not like end to end. Like I shoved in pictures, I got my output, but it's um, by decomposing the problem in this way, you can take advantage of resources that already exist. And then you leave yourself with the very easy task of going over the picture and just counting the number of red pixels. So we're gonna use deep learning for the semantic segmentation step. And then we're just counting for the second step. So like the concept, so I, you know, we've, we've already in some way touched on this, but I just wanted to go a little bit um, into more detail. Uh, because ResNet is so commonly used, and I feel like we gloss over it a little bit. Um, so a ResNet is a convolutional network. It is like basically designed for images. Um, so it expects, like the vanilla ResNet expects a three channel, like red, green, blue image. Um, and it will learn convolutional filters and propagate the image uh, through the network. Um, and it does so in a way, like they use the right amount of um, like padding to make sure that the size doesn't really change unless they want it to. So um, I'll, in the next slide, I'll show like what a re residual block looks like. But here, basically as the color changes, that just indicates that there's been a size change and all the different ResNets have four different size changes. So the difference between like ResNet 34 and ResNet 50 is largely um, the number of uh, different uh, blocks within each of these four size change regimes. And the original task that it was designed for, which is recognizing like what category an image falls into, they end this with a fully connected layer that has a thousand outputs, one output per uh, category of image. And so like the res block, so if we you know like each of these like skips here, the, um, what we're doing is like, we're literally taking the identity. So like the image that I passed in or like the derived image now, depending on what layer you're at, I'm taking that and I am making it my output. So that's the identity function. And so like the actual deep learning part, the part that's like being, like you're doing your convolutional filters on, is the residual. So it's like, um, here is my uh, literal input that I'm going to like on a per pixel basis, sum up 
with the result of these convolutional filters. So it's like actually very straightforward, I guess is what I'm trying to convey. Um, and so you can take a picture of like Big Bird riding a horse, and then you put Big Bird riding a horse through um, a ResNet, and then you just ask it, what is this? Is this a bat, a boat, a bird? It's a bird. Now, just the fact that these were trained for this task doesn't mean that we have to keep the same task at the end. So like what's nice is there is a potential that everything that you've learned um, when you're training this particular model to like learn who Big Bird is, um, all those features are probably relevant for all different image types. So what people um, who have been thinking about this much longer than I have figured out you can do um, for the purpose of semantic segmentation. So like now I'm representing um, our uh, ResNet model entirely on the left side of the screen. Um, and so we're going through our size changes uh, on the left. And what we want is our semantic segmentation output, which is not at all like, you know, categorizing um, a thousand different types of uh, objects, but there's potentially some value in having like these deeper representations of objects as we're trying to learn like which pixels belong to the aorta. And so what uh, this architecture, the, the general concept of, of what's happening here um, was developed for biomedical imaging, which is basically just let's build a convolutional neural network that does sort of get down to like a very um, deep receptive field, but then let's also um, bring information across as we're coming back up to the same dimension as our input. So we have like a one-to-one -one pixel representation. If our input you know, size is 224 by 224, then our output size should be 224 by 224. So we can label every single pixel. Um, it doesn't work very well if you try to just do this fully convolutionally, but it does work pretty well if on your decoder path, you just copy over uh, the input from various layers. So, so like from very early layers, um, but also from deeper layers. So by the time you're decoding, you've learned not only like the semantic content of the image, which you really get from these deeper layers of your encoder, but you're also bringing over this kind of early information that allows you to get a fine grain representation of where that semantic content belongs. So this, I'm calling this a UNet um, like ResNet because the, the, the original UNet didn't use all these layers. It was much simpler, but it's really convenient to be able to just shove a ResNet into this because the amount of pre-training that people have done on ResNets means that all these filters are just so well tuned to visual images that you save yourself a ton of training time. Um, so yeah, so you hear me just like rambling on about like find yourself a pre-trained model over and over and over again, because it, it just saves you a lot of time. Um, okay, so like we basically have like everything we want, we, we know our input, we know our model, we know what type of output we want. You do have to like make that output. So like you have to generate your training data unless it was, I mean, if you're not generating it then someone else did. So at some point, a human almost certainly um, manually did some segmentation for you. Um, so we've developed a tool that we use um, to manually label pixels of whatever um, in an image. I know, know that there are a lot of different tools for this. Um, it doesn't really matter which one you use, just find one that you like using. Um, the asterisk here is that like, uh, there are ways to try to get uh, automatic segmentation based on, uh, if you have like a really large set of data, um, then there are tricks where you can actually get a little bit of self-segmentation, but it's usually just easier to do some manual segmentations yourself. Um, and then, you know, I, I, people are sometimes confused by this. So I just wanted to like touch on it, which is um, 
when I'm showing you like a red pixel overlaid on top of aorta, that's like not actually the, that's just a reference representation of the data. It's not how the data are actually stored. That's just for visualization purposes. Um, so on the left is like a raw image. On the right is the visual representation that I find to be, you know, aesthetically appealing. And in the middle is like the actual representation that I'm storing on disk. And so you could store this information in literally any way that you want to. I like storing this information in a way where the data representation of the input is basically the same, like the same file format as the data representation of the output. But it doesn't have to be like that. You could save it as a text file. You could save it as you know, a JSON object. However you want to do it is fine. So in my case, like this pixel down here, like I mean, it looks black on your screen because all these values are like different shades of black. But this pixel on your screen here, which kind of corresponds to the lung, means nothing to me. So this is just considered background. And then this pixel right here, which you can't see at all, but I know that it's in the aorta, is represented as 040404. So like when I'm post-processing this, I see that value and I'm like, okay, that is aorta. But you can, you can, again, you can store it in whatever way makes sense to you. And then like, you know, if you're, if you're developing your own training data, you have the opportunity to iterate. Um, so here's an example of like one of the earlier, uh, like the output of one of the earlier models that we developed. And I was looking at the extremes of the output. And this was one of the people who had the biggest descending thoracic aortas in the UK biobank. And so I was like, oh, interesting. Like, let's look at the output. And with their descending thoracic aorta is not big at all, but they do have a breast prosthesis. And this is actually like a, a recurring error. Um, and so the way you could solve it in a number of ways, you could just ignore those people. You could like um, identify all of them individually and just exclude them. But for me, it was easier to just, you know, take some of the samples, create a new segmentation category of like breast prosthesis and then train the model to recognize that separately. And so that just kind of got rid of this whole class of error. But you know, I do think it's important anytime you're using deep learning models to um, do this, because otherwise you're gonna, like you are going to give incredibly wrong predictions in a way that, you know, for biomedical research would just be very misleading um, and potentially lead you to some really horrifically incorrect conclusions about like, you know, you, you could misunderstand causality. Um, but then if you were using this clinically, which I, I don't develop models for clinical purposes, but you know, that would obviously be like um, a, a very big problem if that were to happen. So looking at your output <laughs> is uh, an important thing that we should do. Um, and, and like, you know, there's a variety of reasons to iterate. So sometimes like I like to start with big models with very little training data. Like I want to overfit. And um, once I prove that I can overfit, in other words, that my model can learn something, then I'll scale back the model. Um, I always have a test set that I can take a look at to make sure that the model also performs outside of just memorizing the input. Um, and then, you know, I'll have some sort of metrics in mind. I don't always know like how good the accuracy could be. So that part is a little bit of like hit and miss or like a little bit of experimental. Like if I provide more training samples, is it gonna change anything? It sometimes, I mean, it will always make the model, I shouldn't say always, but it will almost always make the model better. Um, but sometimes adding and, you know, doubling your training set size hardly budges the accuracy on your validation set. So there's a little bit of an art to it, but I, I guess I would just say, I think it's very reasonable to start with a small amount of labeled data, try to model it, and then work your way up. And as you add more training samples, eventually you'll hit a point where adding more doesn't really change in a substantive way, the accuracy of your validation and you know, it depends on your task. If, you're, if your task is like, I'm making 
deep learning models for clinical purposes, then yeah, just keep going until you achieve like the best possible model or you know hit some threshold. If you're doing it for kind of like genetic inquiry or like biological inquiry, you don't always need to have perfection. Okay, so we've got our two-stage model. Um, and this is just to say like you, what do you get out of this? Like eventually every piece of data just becomes a new column um, in, you know, in your tab delimited file and you do the usual stuff. So like I'm a geneticist, so I um, wanna do genetics. So here's just an example, something that's reassuring to see, like if you have some biological prior on like how these measurements should work, it's always nice when it gets validated. So we know that beta blockers improve strain. And if I just look at the UK Biobank participants on beta blockers and compare those strain measurements to those not on beta blockers, I see that people on beta blockers have much greater strain, which makes sense. They have a slower heart rate. So they have more time after the impulse of blood from the heart goes in for the aorta to shrink down afterwards. So you, you would expect a slower heart rate from a beta blocker um, to improve your strain, which is what we see. Um, when we take these data forward into GWAS, um, in blue, I'm showing you the loci for ascending and descending strain, um, and then also distensibility, which is just strain divided by um, a value called central pulse pressure, which is, um, it, think about it as like the difference between your systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So in blue, I'm just showing loci that were already seen in the aortic diameter GWAS, which is most of the loci, but you know, 22 of these loci were novel um, and were not already captured just by looking at the diameter. So you know, there's a lot of uh, biological relationship between diameter and strain, but like diameter doesn't capture all of it. Strain does provide you with some different information. I think there's something that came up in the QA. There is, yes. Thanks, Jane, for noticing that. I will read the question. Um, the the uh, audience member is wondering um, if, even for clinical purposes, if you want to go very far on the accuracy and, and whether that possibly impacts generality. Yeah, so I, I, I should preface this by saying, like, I, I intentionally don't develop models for clinical purposes because I think it requires a different thought process. Um, so I... I I don't think I'm like really qualified to answer that question in a meaningful way. Um, I, you know, I, if you think about it from the lens of like, what are you asking the model to do? If the model is just helping the, like the radiologist or the cardiologist, like let's say that you develop a model that, you know, annotates the aorta, but they're still gonna look at it and modify your output. I'm like less worried about the perfection of that model than I am for a model that you're going to use blindly for some task. Um, I don't, I feel like I didn't answer the question, but I can't see it. Um, would you mind restating it? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, and I will, I will um, ask also the audience member who posted this to please jump in if I'm not, if I'm improperly representing the question. So um, the audience member wonders if, um, if for clinical purposes, uh, you want to go very far on the accuracy, um, and I interpret that to mean somehow whether, um, you know, focusing too much on a specific thing might, might uh, sort of impair your ability to oh, make broader conclusions, yeah. I think. But again, I may be misrepresenting this, so please jump in if you, if you ask this question, want to want to do a better job of <laughs> describing it than I did. Thank you. Yeah, so, so, um, Right, so there could be issues. There are like a lot of issues along the way. Like you could run into issues where your training accuracy is like perfect, but then you found that you've just taught a model to memorize your training set. It doesn't validate well. Thank um, you. Yeah, I think that was that was a much better way of saying what I what I was trying to say. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean that. So that that could be an issue. Like, hopefully during the modeling process you would catch that. Right. Like, like you, um, the typical way that we set up our data is like we have a training set we have what's called like a validation set which is seen by the modeling process and it's used to sort of choose those parameters choose when to stop training your model so it's not like a totally separate test set and then ideally you have 
a totally separate test set that like once you've done your model training and you're like, I think my model is good, you then kind of double check on separate data that was not used in the training or the validation process. Um, so, you know, like you should be doing this in a way where you have a good sense of like how accurate your model is, I guess, internally. Um, so I, you know, I think you can get yourself to the point where you're not too worried about like, like overfitting is a problem that you should be able to solve. So I'm not too worried about that. Um, but there's still like a bunch of other problems, like, like there, you know, a few things that people talk about is like domain shift. Like, let's say that over time, um, in your hospital system where you've trained this beautiful deep learning model and it validated great, um, but people are living longer. And so the people that are getting imaged are now older and your model was not trained with people who are of the right age or, or, you know, I mean, I think like the breast um, prosthesis example is a good one too. Like it's uncommon enough that if you randomly take images, you probably didn't capture, you know, someone with a breast prosthesis. So like that's gonna, as we learned, that's gonna totally mess up your model. At least it did for my model. Um, and so it, there are just things that, so, so I'm less worried about not being able to regularize your model. I, I feel like there are a lot of, ways that you can regularize your model. Um, so you don't run into that particular problem, but um, for clinical work, I'm much more concerned about um, like having input that was not seen during model development, you know, having a new MRI scanner in your system, um, trying to take this to a different hospital system where people are selected differently for imaging. Like, I think all those things run the risk of causing your model to not perform as accurately as you thought it did during model training. So I think that would be what I'd be more concerned about. And so I'm sure the people who do clinical deep learning spend a lot of time thinking about that and can speak more eloquently about that. Um, so I know enough to know that I, I don't know all the problems that people run into when they're doing this clinically um, and that it's something that I would basically I would, I would like try to work with an ethicist um during my model development if i were doing deep learning in a clinical setting it, this is a, a follow-up question is it possible to identify while you're, you're sort of training the model um specific images from specific individuals that deviate very far from most of them and is that a way for example to identify you know a set that might usefully be uh, have a label that you didn't include a priori yeah that's a great point um so people do things like contrastive learning which is um uh you i'm going to say this word just because people will see it in the literature so people develop things called like siamese networks i would not use that term i would call it like a twin network um where you feed in um two different images and those images are either of the same person or of different people and you ask the model to just tell me is this the same person or is it someone different and one of the um, representations that you will kind of naturally learn um, is um, or let me phrase it differently this uh, sort of deeper layers become useful um, representations of sort of identity when you train a model like that so you could probably identify people who are very different from the rest. Um, so if there's some visually obvious signal, um, then that would probably work pretty well. Um, so yeah, like I think that there, I guess this is just to say, um, it's not a thing I've done personally, but I, there are pre-existing architectures that I think you could use um, to test that hypothesis. And my guess is it would probably work pretty well. Thank you. I'm gonna skip this. I'm just gonna, we don't really have that much time for the biology, so. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, which is not the point anyway, but like, I, I guess I'll just say like, we did all that because we were motivated to learn about the aorta. And like, we did learn a lot of stuff about the aorta in the process of 
doing that modeling. So it's not like we just did deep learning for deep learning's sake. We learned some biology in the process. Um, so like I, you know, my takeaway is I, I think that um, making decisions about how you represent your input and output and therefore like what type of model you're going to use is an art. Um, but um, I sort of like I don't think usually that the specifics of your deep learning architecture is the most important part, particularly like for those of us with applied questions. Um, and I do think it's really valuable to look at your model's output. Um, it lets you start with fewer training samples. Um, it lets you understand like if you're making errors in a systematic way and potentially correcting those um, to build a better model. Um, and eventually, you know, it can help you understand if you chose the right model representation in the first place. Um, for in terms of resources, you know, I really like the fast AI course. I do think the framework is limiting eventually, but at the beginning, if you want to go from like not doing any deep learning to like actually having done some deep learning, I would say fast AI is a really good way to sort of get up to speed quickly. It's about doing rather than about theory. Um, and then I think something like either, you know, Jan LeCun's uh, deep learning course, which is free online, um, or like uh, Andrew Ng's Coursera course, which I'm not sure if it's free anymore, um, are, are also good resources once you're ready to sort of like think about um, the theory. As far as frameworks go, I like PyTorch, Jax and TensorFlow are also very popular. And I think that's all we have time for. I think that's true as well. Thank you so much, James. That was really, really um, an interesting talk. And thanks to everyone who posted questions. Thank you.